Good morning, Mission Church. Woody here. Uh, I want to say happy Sunday. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning uh, for church at home. Uh, church looks a little bit different right now. And so we're glad that you decided to join us online. Uh, in case you didn't hear, uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot going on in the news lately uh, all around the world. And, and how that's affecting us a little bit is uh, church is going to be different the next couple weeks. So this Sunday and the next Sunday, uh, March 22nd. We're not going to be meeting in person at our normal location at Copper Trails. We're going to be having church at home online right here on Facebook Live. So um, we're really glad you're here with us this morning. I want to encourage you next Sunday, uh, please come back, join us again. Uh, but next Sunday, we want to encourage you to watch church at home, uh, but do with your small group. Uh, small groups are a great uh, opportunity that we have here at Mission to connect with other people. And so next Sunday, we're going to encourage every group, uh, get together Sunday morning, uh, watch the online message with us. Uh, we're even working on uh, as much as we can uh, to, to have a great worship experience for you. So we're working on some other elements for that for next week uh, and getting ready for that. So I uh, really want to encourage you to join us uh, with that next week as well with your small group. So a couple announcements I want to share uh, since you're here with us right now. Uh, one is coming up on Easter Sunday, April 12th. We're going to be having baptisms. And if you've been to mission before on a baptism Sunday, you know it's one of the best Sundays. Uh, we love to celebrate and see the life change that God is doing and how He's at work. And so we're going to be celebrating some of those stories. Uh, and, and we know that there are some people out there uh, that, that are ready for that next step. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never been baptized, this is the best step for you to take in following Jesus. Uh, so in order to get you ready for that, I want to encourage you, we're going to have some baptism classes uh, on the 29th, uh, so March 29th, and then on April 5th. Uh, the two Sundays that we'll be back will be at Copper Trails, and uh, we want to meet with you. We want to talk to you about baptism and get you ready for that. Uh, that time and, and that great celebration. And so uh, even if you want to get more info, you want to sign up for the class right now, uh, you can go online to our website. It's joinmission.com forward slash baptisms, or you can go on our app and get signed up as well to get ready for that. Another important thing here at Mission is giving. Uh, and, and we couldn't do the ministry that we do here in our community without uh, people being generous and having a hand in what God's doing here. Uh, especially during this time right now, uh, as a church, we're uh, more aware than ever that our community needs us. And so uh, we're, we're especially on the lookout for ways that we can be in support of our community and the people uh, in Goodyear in the West Valley. And so uh, our, our generosity and our giving uh, only helps us to be able to support more what's happening here. So uh, if you do call Mission Home uh, and you want to give with us, uh, you can do that online through our app uh, or through texting us. Uh, that's just a great way to contribute to what God is doing here. So there are plenty of ways to give, uh, but if you're just tuning in for the first time, uh, you've never been to mission, uh, that's okay. Don't worry about that. We just want you to, to even have a little bit of hope right now during this difficult season of life around the world. And so thank you so much for giving with us. If you do give, uh, that makes a huge difference. Uh, well, I wanted to share a verse uh, here uh, that, that I think is just so timely uh, and a good reminder for us. So this is from Psalm 46. Uh, Psalm 46 verses 1 and 2, they say, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way. I just love that reminder that during this time, it can be so easy with, with different, uh, different social media and news and, and all these things going on around us that, that seem to, to be adding fuel to the fire that, that causes panic and causes worry and stress in our lives right now. And, and during this time, I want to encourage you, take a deep breath, slow down, and remember that God is God and that God is in control and that just like, uh, just like we love to talk about here at Mission, that God is for us. God is for each and every one of us and He is our refuge, He's our rock, and He's the one that we can turn to in times where, where we don't know what's gonna happen next, where we feel a little uneasy. And so during these moments, even during this message, we hope it's, it's a time of rest and peace for you that you can lean in and see how much Jesus loves us, how good He is. Uh, so, 
Uh, if it's okay, I want to pray. Uh, I want to pray for us uh, right now and just take a moment doing that. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? God, we love you. Uh, we know that, that during times of, of an uncertainty that it can be so easy to, uh, to try to turn inward and look only to our own needs and just worry about ourselves. God, I pray that, that right now during these times that one, you would give, you'd give us peace, a peace that, that you can promise uh, through your Holy Spirit. And so we ask that that would be evident in our lives. And that God, that that peace, that calmness, that trust in you uh, would just motivate us to be people of love, joy, and peace right now. Uh, God, it can be so easy to, to get distracted and to worry about ourselves. But God, when we're focused on you, uh, we can love our neighbor. We can care for those, uh, God, who, who aren't uh, having a good time right now, who, who are suffering, who are struggling. And so we want to be people who love our community and show that we're for them for good year. So God, help us to be those people. God, I pray for our world right now uh, that, that you, would, uh, you would just bring protection, that you would bring safety and security uh, to, to every corner of the earth, God, that, that we would be wise, that we would make good decisions uh, for the interest of others, God. And uh, lastly, I want to pray for the church. God, uh, God, we've seen throughout the history uh, of, of this movement, this church that you're building, that God, uh, that times of crisis are times when, when we can really be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I pray during this time, God, where, where, uh, where up feels like down and, and we don't know what's coming next, God, that, uh, that we would live out your love. That, God, we would, we would love you and love people genuinely and look out for the best interests of others. And I pray that, that you would use these difficult circumstances as, as a way to bring people to you, as a way for us to love people towards you, Jesus. So I pray that we would, uh, we would live out this mission that you've given us right now. And we pray that you'd bless this time, bless this morning. We thank you for every person tuned in watching. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much again for being with us here uh, this Sunday. Uh, we're excited for what God's going to do and how he's at work. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Mission Church. Thank you so much for tuning in with us here online as we uh, continue to have church. You know, in the midst of situations like we're experiencing right now, it is so important for us to gather with family and friends, to pray together, to keep our focus on Christ. I think one of the best things we can actually do right now is just to continue in the regular normal rhythms that we would have. In the spirit of that today, I want to continue our regular series that we started last Sunday called Big Picture Bible. If you remember, last week we talked about the fact that so often we're looking at small verses or chapters of the Bible at a time, and sometimes we miss the larger picture of what the Bible is really all about, the bigger story. And last Sunday we talked about that really, even though the Bible is made up of 66 different books, uh, the Old and New Testaments, or the Old and New Covenants is more appropriately named, uh, even though there's all of these parts that there's one theme and there's one message that unites the whole thing, and that's the story of redemption, as God is bringing about the healing and restoration of His people. Now today, as we continue the series, one of the things I want you to see is that God is sovereignly working throughout human history to bring about His purposes. I think that's such a great comfort in times like this when we're battling things like the coronavirus to remember God is in control and God is literally working in every aspect of our lives and every aspect of history to weave together His perfect story. So today we want to begin by unpacking the Old Testament. I've called this message the story of the Old Testament. 
Sometimes the Old Testament can be a confusing book for us. It can be a book with genealogies and places like the temple that we don't have or go to anymore. Things like animal sacrifices, um, prophets whose names we can't pronounce. And it's hard to understand where and how we fit into the story and where and how all of those pieces fit together to really communicate God's bigger story. So what I want to do today is I want to start by unpacking nine major events and people from the Old Testament that help sort of tell the story as it unfolds. I think it'll help you as later when you go back to read the Old Testament, you'll be able to fit different chapters or books of the Bible into this bigger picture story. And most of all, what I want us to see is that every event, every person, every chapter of the Old Testament is ultimately pointing to one thing, and that is the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's the unfolding of God's plan of redemption and restoration. And so we're going to see that all through the Old Testament, in every genealogy, in every character, in every story that unfolds, we're going to see that it's moving us closer and closer to the revealing of Jesus as the Messiah when we come to the New Testament. So the first event in the Old Testament, if you're keeping a track, maybe you're taking notes in the Mission Church app, the first event that I want to talk about is the event of creation. The Bible begins with the creation story, and God creates everything that we see and know in the universe, and He says it is good, it is very good, and He blesses it. And as we talked about last week, God made us in creation to enjoy him and to enjoy one another in perfect peace and harmony. The problem is that man fell. And that brings us to the second major event of the Old Testament, the fall. This is when Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God in the Garden of Eden, chose to do life their own way, chose to ignore God's commandments. And because of that, it, it unleashed brokenness and sin in the world that have been affecting us ever since. Every single person in the human race is stained by this event that happened when Adam and Eve wandered away from God. Now, the amazing reality is that when God confronts Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, and he's sort of doling out the punishment, if you will, because they've broken his commandments, he makes there in the very first book of the Bible, in the third chapter, a promise. It's a powerful promise. It's in Genesis 3, 15, and it says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent, to Satan. And he says there's going to be conflict between you and Eve. He says, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In this statement, Jesus is talking about a Messiah that's going to come and crush the enemy Satan and bruise his head. And yes, the enemy is going to bruise his heel, but it's going to be very minor and Jesus is going to come and have the ultimate victory. Right here in Genesis 3, in the very beginning of scripture, we have God's promise that, that the fall will not be the final chapter of the story of mankind. From the very beginning, it's clear to us that God is unfolding his purposes of redemption. Now, the third major uh, character in the Bible that I want you to see is a man named Abraham. Abraham is introduced in Genesis chapter 9. And what's powerful is Abraham is called the father of the nation of Israel. In fact, God appears to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God makes an astounding promise to Abraham that really sets the tone and the pace for the entire rest of the Bible. And I want to share with you Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where we see this promise to Abraham. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I want you to notice in these verses that there are three distinct promises that God makes to Abram. Abram, remember, is the father of Israel. 
The first promise that he makes is he says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you your own homeland. The second promise that he gives is he says, I'm going to give you descendants that are as, as numerous as the stars. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And the third promise that God makes, and the most important one, is he says that Abram, through you, all the families and nations of the earth will be blessed. This is a promise that the Messiah would come through the generation of Israel, through the nation of Israel. God would raise up a Messiah through the seed of the woman Eve and now through Israel, starting with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, the fathers of Israel. You see God building this nation. Now, the interesting part about the Old Testament is really it's a historical document. It's a record for us that preserves God's dealings, not with the whole world, but specifically with one small nation, the nation of Israel. And so Abraham gives us this introduction as he is chosen by God sovereignly to be the father of the people who would one day produce the Messiah. Now, eventually God takes his people down to the nation of Israel and they find themselves in captivity. The fourth major event of the Old Testament is what we call the Exodus. You see, God's people had been in the nation of Egypt and they had become involved in bondage and slavery. God heard their cry and he sent a deliverer by the name of Moses. And Moses came to set the people free and to lead them out of bondage in captivity. The only problem is Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. And so God used Moses and brought 10 plagues on the nation of Egypt. 10 different plagues culminating in the last one, which was the death of all the firstborn sons. In fact, only the people of Israel's sons were spared who took the blood of the lamb and spread it over the doorposts of their house so that the death angel passed over their homes and the people of Israel celebrate the Passover feast, remembering the fact that the angel of the Lord passed over them and spared their lives because of the blood of the lamb. What an amazing picture of what Jesus, the lamb of God, would do when he shed his blood for us on the cross. So the Exodus, the people came out of Israel. They were happy. They were excited. They were on their way to the promised land. And they came to a place called Mount Sinai. The fifth major event is the covenant that God makes with his people at Mount Sinai. The interesting part about this covenant or this agreement that God made with his people is that this was a conditional covenant. God said, if you do these things and you follow my commandments and obey my laws, then I will bless you and I will protect you and I will give you health and good crops and protection from your enemies and you will be a blessed people. But if you fail to follow my commandments, God said, then I will curse you and, and I will not bring about the blessings that I've promised you and your crops will not grow and your enemies will have victory over you. This was a conditional covenant that God entered into with the nation of Israel where he gave them the laws, the 10 commandments and said, I want you to follow these commandments. Now, one of the confusing things that we need to unpack a little bit is that this covenant was made specifically between God and the nation of Israel. This covenant is not between God and all the individuals in the nation of Israel. It was them as a corporate body. In addition, this covenant was not made with you and I. In fact, you and I should be thankful that this covenant doesn't apply to us because history has shown that we're unable to keep all the commandments of God and enjoy his blessings. We're going to see next Sunday that in the new covenant that God has brought, it's an unconditional covenant where God brings his blessings despite what we do. So we're thankful that this covenant does not apply to us as God's people today. This was a conditional covenant between God and the nation of Israel. Now the sixth major event in the Old Testament is the people of God wandering in the wilderness. You see, they were waiting to enter, enter into the promised land and God was leading them to this amazing place, a land flowing with milk and honey. The problem was the people didn't want to trust God. They complained, they moaned against God. And so in the wilderness, God allowed an entire generation to pass away and die before bringing a new generation into the promised land, a generation who had the faith and trust to believe that God would lead them 
into the promised land. So then you have mighty warriors like Joshua who take the helm of leadership in the nation of Israel and lead the people of God into the promised land and begin to conquer all the enemy nations that are occupying this territory so that they can have their own land, they can have their own place as a nation. As soon as they began to be established in the promised land, then they began to look around at the nations around them and they wanted to be like the other nations. And so they told God, God, give us a king because we want to be like the other nations of the world. And so then in the Old Testament, we see God relenting and giving in to the wishes of the people of Israel and providing for them a king. The first king that we see is King Saul. God brings King Saul, and, and honestly, God didn't want to bring a king into the picture because he wanted to be the king of Israel. He wanted the people of Israel to follow his leadership, to trust his wisdom and guidance, not a man. But the people wanted to be like the other nations of the world. And so that's when you have Saul, uh, David, the king who was after God's own heart, and then finally Solomon. And after that, the kingdom of Israel became divided and, and torn into two parts. And, and there's a, a lot of history that takes place there because the kings of Israel ultimately could not solve the problems. They could not rule the land in a way that was pleasing to God. They could not keep the people together following after God. It was a reminder that what they really needed was one true king instead of these earthly kings. And that leads us to number eight. The eighth thing that we see in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, is this cycle of blessing and pain. You remember that conditional covenant, right, from Mount Sinai, where God said, if you follow me, then I'll bless you and protect you and, and heal you and, and take care of you. Well, so often the people of Israel would fall away from God. They would stop following him. They would worship idols and false gods. And so God would allow them uh, to, to fall into hard times. God would bring suffering and difficulty into their lives. And eventually through the challenges of, of war and famine and, and so many problems, the people of God would repent and return to God. And then the cycle would start again, where as they followed God, God would bring blessing and healing and, and the people would enjoy that. But eventually they would forget God and their hearts would wander away and they would begin to worship idols again. And so the cycle would continue, blessing and pain, blessing and pain. It's all pointing to the fact that you and I as human beings, that, that the nation of Israel was unable to follow this conditional covenant that God had created. They were unable to walk with God and keep all of his commands and laws. The human heart was simply too flawed. The law was pointing to us the fact that we needed a savior, that we needed a Messiah. The next thing we see in the Bible, number nine is this, it's the prophets. God raised up many prophets in the nation of Israel. People like Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. People like Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And in the Old Testament, you'll see many of these books of the Bible. And what they're doing is they're calling Israel as a nation to come back to God. It's usually in the midst of that cycle of blessing and pain. And it's, it's mostly when they're in this place of pain and suffering. And the, the prophets are crying out to the people and saying, if you would just return to God, he will heal. If you would just come back to God, he will bless you. And, and so the prophets are constantly calling people back to God. In fact, one of the prophecies that you've probably heard before, one of the more popular verses in the Bible is Jeremiah 29, 11. You've probably heard this uh, verse before. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now remember this Old Testament, this Old Covenant is between God and a nation of Israel. It's not between God and us. And so this promise actually was made from Jeremiah to the people of Israel. What many people miss is that the people of Israel at this time were living in captivity in the land of Babylon. This was actually a promise to them that God would deliver them. In fact, if you read uh, the verse before, verse 10, it kind of puts it into context a little bit. Verse 10 says, Thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise and I will bring you back to this place, to your land. And so this verse should not really be the one we put in a greeting card, you know, for graduating seniors. 
Because I think probably most of them don't want to wait 70 years for God's blessing until they're in their late 80s. Uh, I think we have a better promise that was made to us in the New Covenant, in the New Testament part of the Bible. And so we have to be careful how we read the promises of God in the Old Testament. They're not all written for our benefit. They were written and need to be read and understood in their context. So God used the prophets of Israel to call his people during that season back to himself and back to relationship with him. One of the amazing things when you go back and study the prophecies of the Old Testament is you see that so many of them made predictions and prophecies about the Messiah who would come. In fact, did you know that in the Old Testament there are more than 300 specific prophecies about the coming and birth of the Messiah? That's mind-blowing. What else is mind-blowing is the fact that Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. Now, I want to point out for you just eight of them today as we, as we walk through this. Eight prophecies that Jesus fulfilled that were written hundreds of years before his birth by the prophets of God. The first one is this, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah predicted that way before Jesus was even born. No one can control where they're born, and yet Jesus was the Messiah who was born in Bethlehem. The prophet Isaiah predicted that Jesus would be preceded by a messenger who would call people to come and to to hear from God's Messiah. The prophet Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah would enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Those are the first three prophecies. But number four is this. Number four is that the Messiah would be betrayed by a friend. This is from Psalm 41. Not only that, but Zechariah tells us he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and that the money would be used to buy a potter's field. Very specific prophecies and statements about Jesus and the future Messiah to come. Not only that, but the Messiah would stand silent before his accusers, Isaiah tells us. And finally, in the Psalms, we're told that the Messiah would die by crucifixion. It's interesting because the Romans hadn't even invented crucifixion yet when that was written. And yet Jesus came and fulfilled every single prophecy, all eight of these prophecies. Now, a famous mathematician actually wrote a book about the probability of Jesus fulfilling just these eight prophecies and what that would mean for someone to fulfill all eight of these prophecies. And he came up with this number that the probability of any one human being fulfilling all eight of these prophecies was calculated to be one in one times 17 zeros after it. I mean, it's so big of a number, I can't say it or pronounce it. It's a huge number. The only way I could get my mind around it is Josh McDowell, one of the famous apologists, wrote in one of his books about how if you took this number, and you converted that into silver dollars, and you took all of these silver dollars and you dumped them into the state of Texas, that literally the state of Texas would be filled with silver dollars two feet high. And if you marked one of those silver dollars and mixed it in somewhere in the entire state of Texas, and then you gave someone a blindfold and you turned them loose to wander through the entire state of Texas and to choose just one silver dollar out of all of those silver dollars That's the same probability as one person fulfilling every prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. So Jesus fulfilled all eight of these prophecies that pointed to his coming. You see, the Old Testament is all about pointing us to who Jesus is, to pointing us to a future Messiah. The Old Testament is that historical uh, record of God's dealings with the nation of Israel, God preparing a nation who would birth a Messiah, God writing the backstory that would lead us to Jesus. Listen to Psalm 130, verse 7. It says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. You see, even the psalmist, even every every Old Testament writer was in some way writing a picture or an image or, or a story that would eventually point people to God's purpose and God's plan through Christ in the redemption of his people through his greater story 
Next week, we're going to look at the New Testament and we're going to see how Jesus not only fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, but how he came to create a new covenant, how the old covenant was fulfilled and, and, and completed. And then Jesus came and brought a new covenant, uh, a new relationship basis for the people of God. And so that's where we're going to go next week. But the question kind of remains of what do we do with the Old Testament? I mean, we, we have these Bibles where the old and the new covenants are, are joined together in one book and, and we're kind of told to read them. And so often we make the mistake of, of not understanding the differences between the old and the new. And so how can we understand and relate to the Old Testament? Uh, because it is still such an important book. After all, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. So we believe that the Old Testament is the word of God, that it is 100% scripture. But here's the thing, we also understand that it's primarily a historical record of God's dealings with one nation, the people of Israel. We understand that in that context, the old covenant, the, the covenant that God made with Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, the conditional covenant, doesn't apply to us. Many of the Old Testament laws and commandments don't apply to us anymore today because we're living now under the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated. So one thing we have to keep in mind, the Old Testament promises are not for us. And so we have to be careful about just opening the Old Testament and claiming all of those promises as valid for today. Now, one thing we can do is we can learn about the character of God in the Old Testament. We can understand the beautiful historical uh, uh, factors that God is working and bringing about through human history to set the stage for the coming of his Messiah. We can look for principles in the Old Testament that tell us who God is and what his character is and how he deals with his people and principles that help us to live our lives. For example, in the Proverbs, principles of God's wisdom applied to the people of God then as much as they do today. So it's not that the Old Testament is invalid. It's not that it's not the word of God. The Old Testament is powerful. We just need to understand it in its original context. We need to find inspiration from the Old Testament, not necessarily application from the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is this amazing historical record that preserves for us God's dealings in human history through the nation of Israel to bring us to the place where the Messiah could be born. You see, really all of the Old Testament is pointing us to the fact that a Messiah is coming. Every single author in the Old Testament, every single book points us to the fact that a Messiah is coming, that Jesus is coming. In Genesis, Jesus is the breath of God. He's the creator of all things. In Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb who is slaughtered for his people that they might be saved. In Leviticus, Jesus is the high priest, the one who leads his people and, and mediates before God. In Numbers, Jesus is the pillar of fire that leads his people through the wilderness and darkness by night. In the book of Ruth, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer who purchases us and redeems us. In First and Second Samuel, Jesus is our prophet, our trusted prophet who speaks the words of God to us. In Nehemiah, Jesus is the one who's rebuilding broken walls and broken lives. In Job, Jesus is the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, Jesus is the song of our salvation. In Proverbs, Jesus is wisdom crying out to us to walk with God as only we can. In Ecclesiastes, Jesus is wisdom for every time and season. In Isaiah, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah, Jesus is the prophet who weeps and is broken for his people. In Ezekiel, Jesus gives life to the dry bones as they're resurrected. In Daniel, Jesus is the stranger in the fire. In Hosea, Jesus is forever faithful despite how many times we wander away from God. In Joel, Jesus is the Spirit's power. In Jonah, Jesus is the great missionary who dies and, and is buried in the belly of a whale for three days, but rises again 
to share the good news of redemption in Christ. In Habakkuk and Zephaniah, Jesus pleads for revival. And in Malachi, Jesus is the son of righteousness who's rising with healing in his wings. You see, literally every chapter, every verse, every book of the Old Testament is pointing to one thing, and that's Jesus. And if you read the Old Testament and you miss that the whole story is really all about redemption in Christ, then you've missed it. And so I want to encourage you, go back and read the Old Testament with fresh eyes and a new perspective. Go back into these books and see what does this book teach me about the coming of a Messiah who would set his people free. It's interesting because in the book of John, we have this recorded conversation of Jesus with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. And the Pharisees were kind of missing the point. And Jesus says something to them that's so powerful. He says this in John chapter 5, verse 39 through 40. You search the scriptures. That was the Old Testament. It was all the scriptures they had at the time. And Jesus says, you're searching through the Old Testament scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You see, the Pharisees were so interested in following all the rules and commandments of the Old Testament to the letter of the law. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute, all of those laws, all of those commandments, all of those genealogies, they all point to me. And you're missing the whole thing if you don't see that the Old Testament is really written about one character in human history, and that's Jesus. All of it points to being fulfilled and culminating in the birth, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so that's the story of the Old Testament. It's a story that points in one direction, and that's to Jesus as our Redeemer. And you know what? I'm so encouraged as I, as I think through this with you today. It reminds me that God is sovereign over human history. I mean, if you can't read the Old Testament and not see that God is orchestrating every event, every detail, so that Jesus arrives on the scene at exactly the right point in human history. In a day and a time right now where our nation is afraid, where we're dealing with fear and coronavirus and all kinds of unknown things, isn't that a comfort to us? To know that God is sovereign over human history, that God is at work and that God is bringing about his purposes. You know what else the Old Testament tells me? It tells me that God loves us so much. God literally spent thousands of years just to set the stage to bring about a Messiah for us. And so God loves us so much. The Old Testament is, is a testament to God's love and unconditional, unfailing love for his people. So the Old Testament is an amazing story. It's an amazing book, but it points us to our Redeemer in Christ. And today, if you're watching this and you've never made that decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not to follow a bunch of rules and commandments from the Bible, but to enter into a relationship with Jesus, the Redeemer, the one who would set you free from your sins. That's the whole purpose of the Bible. That's the whole purpose of the Old Testament. Every chapter and verse pointing to Jesus. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you. Jesus came because the world is broken. Remember, all of us at the fall have encountered the brokenness and the difficulty of sin. And all of us struggle, and all of us fail and falter, and all of us need a Savior. All of us need a Messiah. In fact, none of us is good enough, as the law of the Old Testament proved, none of us is good enough to always do the right thing to please God. None of us could earn His blessing and favor. We all wander away. We all tend to worship other gods. We all fall away. And yet Jesus came and died for us. Jesus came and gave his life so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and so that he could reverse the effects of the fall and give us new life in him. And so today I want to invite you, if you've never made that decision, today you can put your faith and trust in Jesus right where you are watching online. You can simply pray to God and say, God, I want to invite you into my life. I believe that Jesus came to this earth that he died for my sins, and that by believing in him, I can have forgiveness and eternal life. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. 
Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this story, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant story about the dealings of God with the people of Israel. Lord, thank you that you sovereignly worked throughout human history to bring about the Messiah in a place where it would be the perfect time and a place for the Redeemer to come who would save us from our sins. And thank you, God, that no longer are we bound by this old covenant, conditional covenant that that means if we don't do all the right things, we're not blessed by you. But now we have this hope and this promise in Jesus that by trusting in what he's done for us, we can have the hope of eternal life. Not because we're good enough, not because we keep all the rules, not because we do all the right things, but simply because we trust in what Jesus has already done for us. And so God, right now, I pray, if there's anyone watching who has never put their faith and trust in Jesus alone for eternal life, for salvation, that right now in this moment, they would turn to you and they would seek you. Lord, I pray that that you would be at work in every heart And if that's you this morning, I want to invite you to pray a very simple prayer and you can put your faith and trust in Jesus. You can pray something like this. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I could never obey your laws and keep your commandments. I could never be good enough to earn favor with God or eternal life. But I believe that Jesus came to this earth and that he died to pay the penalty for my sins and that he rose again to purchase a place in heaven for me. And today I wanna put my trust in you and invite you to come into my life to save me and to set me free. I want to be a child of God and I want to follow you the rest of my life. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness of sins. Thank you for loving and saving me. In Jesus name I pray, amen. And today, if you made that decision and you prayed to receive Christ, we are so excited for you about your journey with God. And we want to welcome you into the family of God. We want to encourage you, please tell someone, tell your small group leader, uh, talk to a trusted friend who's a believer in Jesus. If you're watching online and you don't have anyone to talk to, we would love for you to text us and let us know that you made that response. You can text the word life to the number on your screen. And we would love to follow up with you and give you more information about walking with Jesus and how you can know him. As a final note, I wanna let you know during these difficult times, if you have a need or a prayer concern or a challenge that myself or our church staff team can assist you with, please do not hesitate to reach out to us by phone or by social media channels or by email. We would love to encourage you and shepherd you through this season. I believe that just as God worked through all of human history to orchestrate every event for the coming Messiah, God is literally working right now in our day, in our time, to use everything that's happening for His glory and for ultimate good. And so I'm believing that in the days to come, there are going to be amazing opportunities for the gospel and for good in our community. So let's stay positive. Let's keep our faith and trust in God alone, and let's encourage one another as we walk with Him. God bless you, and thank you again for watching.